Good evening. I'm Ann Harrison, the Dean of the Haas School of Business. I'm really pleased to welcome you to tonight's book launch party. I know author Don Moore as the Lorraine Tyson Mitchell Chair of Leadership here at Haas. I also know of Don's singular obsession with the study of confidence, which fits into our school defining leadership principle, confidence with attitude. Sorry, confidence without attitude. Most of what I see from Don is well calibrated confidence with only the occasional attitude. All joking aside, I really loved Don's book. Hopefully you can see it. One of the things that Don talks about is imposter syndrome. The first time I, one of the first times I met Don, he was walking on the Haas campus and he looked at me, didn't know him very well. He's walking towards me, I'm walking towards him and he says, so are you still experiencing imposter syndrome? I had just started as the Dean at Haas. Now, at the time, I felt that this was slightly kind of insulting, but now that I've read this book, I understand that, in fact, it was a compliment, because this is what Don writes about imposter syndrome. When performing a task that's hard for everyone, many people experience imposter syndrome. And so the reason I might have experienced this, because I was trying to do something that's really hard for people, and so I wasn't necessarily calibrating myself properly. So that was actually a really important insight for me to learn. I'm also pleased to welcome Max Bazerman, who's the Jesse Isidore Strauss Professor of Business Administration at Harvard Business School. Max has published more papers, articles, and books than I possibly have time to recount here. He's a leader in the field and he's won many awards. Most relevant for today is his role as the dissertation advisor to Don Moore. We're gonna hear about how his mentorship helped Don calibrate his confidence by providing direct and honest feedback, such as when he made Don cry by shooting down his first dissertation proposal. I'm really looking forward to hearing this conversation, learning more about Don's book. Perfectly confident. Take it away, Max. Thank you, Dean Harrison. It's a pleasure to be part of this event, um, to be able to talk to my good friend, Don Moore. Um, Don's truly one of the great social scientists around. Um, and Don, I'm just going to get started by asking you to tell us what possessed you to write this book. <laughs> um, having studied overconfidence, uh, thank you for that in introduction, uh, Dean Harrison, and, and great to be with you, Max. Thanks for being, being part of tonight. Um, having studied overconfidence and underconfidence for 20 years now, I have lessons and insights that I wanted to share with the world. I, I knew that the probability of a book that I would write taking off and reaching the large audience I aspired to reach was not very likely. That um, the, There's a high probability of the book succeeding in, uh, or low probability of the book succeeding a high probability that it wouldn't, um, but that that chance was still worth it. So I decided, what the hell? Great, well, thank you. Um, before I move on to another question, let me just mention any, uh, all the viewers are welcome to send in questions under the Q&A function. Um, and hopefully we'll get to some of those uh, later on in the discussion. Um, so Don, a lot of the people watching um, took time out, a, a time away from their obsession with COVID-19. Um, so maybe you could connect these two events. Um, what can you tell us about the role of different levels of confidence in terms of the mess that we're in? And help us think about wh what's the role of confidence as we hopefully will get out of COVID at some point at, in the appropriate future. I think some of the dangers of overconfidence are underscored by our nation's leadership. Um, it seems pretty obvious that if Donald Trump had been better calibrated about the risks that the coronavirus presented, that he might have been earlier to action in January when public health experts were sounding the alarm and we might have been able to avoid some of the colossal and catastrophic costs in our nation's health and economy that we're facing now. Going forward, 
it seems like we need well calibrated honesty from our leaders about the risks of disease transmission on the one hand and economic shutdown on the other. Uh, they're difficult decisions to be made. They're most likely to be successful when informed by honest estimates of their likely consequences. And for us making decisions about our own lives, how much to risk interacting with others, how much to risk getting out in the world, we need to have good information. Honest communication from well-calibrated leaders is enormously helpful in uh, supporting wise decision-making. So are you implying that had our leader read your book, um, an advanced copy last December, we might have tens of thousands of Americans alive today who are not? Uh, I don't think I should presume that our uh, leader uh, would read my book, uh, um, but I'd be, uh, if he absorbed its lessons, I would hope that maybe. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll interpret that in my own way, but thank you. <laughs> um, so now, um, this topic of overconfidence um, or confidence, you're, you're certainly not the first social science scientist to write about it. Um, so Danny Kahneman, the author of Thinking Fast and Slow, um, sitting around with a Nobel Prize, has talked about this as being the most important bias um, affecting humans because it leads to us to be affected by all the other biases as well. But we can go back even 100 years before that. And William J James, um, uh, a very early psychologist at Harvard University, um, also talked about um, confidence. Um, you talk about that in your book. Can you, would you either read to us about William James or tell us the story as you prefer? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll, I'll, uh, the, the, the passage on William James has been one of the ones from the book that I found myself recounting uh, most frequently. So uh, I'll, I'll uh, read it. Um, in 1878, the psychologist William James wrote about the power of positive visualization. He imagined himself climbing in the mountains and getting stuck at a spot from which he must take a bold, dangerous leap. He wrote, I may wish to make the leap, but I'm ignorant from lack of experience whether I have the strength for it. James describes two possible outcomes. In the first, he believes what he desires. He imagines that his confidence gives him the strength to make the leap successfully. The confident James believes in himself. He jumps and he makes it. The second outcome imagines self-doubt. This doubting James hesitates, wavers, and then, weakened and trembling, compelled to take the leap by sheer despair, I miss my aim and fall into the crevasse. James concludes that in a situation like this, I should be a fool if I did not believe what I wished, as my belief happens to be a preliminary condition which is essential to the accomplishment of the end which it affirms. In other words, James imagines a situation in which his beliefs make themselves come true. As such, a wise person should have faith, and his faith would bring him success. When I first read James's account, I took it as a persuasive argument for the benefits of optimism. There are undeniably situations in which the belief in positive out outcomes increases the chances that one will choose to go for it and thereby increases the opportunity for the positive outcomes one expects. If believing you can leap the crevasse increases the chance you jump, it must also increase the chance that you make it. On the other hand, the fear of failure can easily scare you off from the attempt. One implication you might be tempted to take away is that positive visualization leads to good outcomes. You wouldn't be the first to think so. However, you would also be right to be skeptical. While simply imagining your company's rocket successfully making it into orbit may be pleasurable, it will not directly increase the odds of successful launch any more than visualizing yourself as Pope will transport you to Rome. For the reflection on William James's story of his Alpine adventure raised additional concerns for me that I had failed to consider the first time. If the doubting James really expected to fall into the crevasse, making the jump seems like a bad call. If it were me, I'd like to think I would explore other ways out of the predicament that were less likely to end in my death. But more important than that, if the moral of the story is that it's always better to believe that you can jump the crevasse, that seems wrong. Sometimes you can't jump the crevasse. Sometimes it's just too wide. How wide is too wide? Perhaps the doubting James could jump a five foot crevasse, but let's say that believing in himself could get him another foot. 
Then if the crevasse were less than six feet, James should repeat some empowering self-affirmations and go for it. But if the chasm were 20 feet wide, no amount of positive self-talk would get him across. Believing in yourself, if it prompts you to jump to your death, would qualify as a mistake, however much it displays an admirable confidence in your capabilities. It is an error that could be avoided with better calibrated confidence. There will be many domains in life where confidence can help you perform, but its benefits will be limited. Setting impossible goals can be like leaping into a 20-foot chasm, inspiringly ambitious, but doomed to failure. Interesting. So um, I, I, most of us aren't going to jump crevasses, but we might um, sort of be in a football huddle and the play's been called and we need to implement, or we might be a salesperson and we're actually on the sales call, or we might be a um, author of a book being interviewed. Um, in those situations, is having a bit of extra confidence, even a bit of extra confidence beyond um, what's objectively justifiable, is a bit of extra overconfidence a good or bad thing in those contexts? Uh, that's a good question. Um, one version of your question, Max, is whether being overconfident um, might actually help you accomplish more. In the context of William James' bold leap, if he, could, if he believed he could jump 10 feet, might it enable him to make it seven rather than six feet? Well, I think that might be possible under some circumstances. I think it's also worth noting the potential risks. If his belief led him to leap into a nine foot chasm that wouldn't end well, or it's also conceivable that such confidence could have persuaded him that he didn't need to try as hard, didn't need to get a good running start. The students in my class who are most sure that they're gonna ace the exam and therefore think they don't need to study are not those who wind up getting the best grades. And the answer is, is it better for you to be extra overconfident or perfectly calibrated? I think the evidence is most consistent with the benefits of being perfectly calibrated, which I would hasten to add does not mean lowering your sights because all of us have vast untapped potential and we can accomplish greater things than we have in the past or than we might assume that we can accomplish. When you can successfully throw the football, when you can successfully make the sale, when you can successfully withstand grilling to a lar in front of a large audience by your PhD advisor without breaking down in tears, then you should believe in yourself and you should go for it. But that sounds like good calibration to me. So that's the second time tears came up. So the Dean brought up your tears and, and now you're mentioning tears again. Um, and I only have a vague recollection of the, of the, of the, of this episode, but I have more recollection because it's in your book of a different episode where I viewed you as underconfident. Um, can you share that with the audience either you feel free, again, feel free to read, or if you prefer, you can describe as you see fit. So this was when I was coming out in the job market. I desperately wanted an academic job, but was petrified that I wouldn't get a job, that I'd be unemployable. So um, having uh, been in grad school for five years, um, I... Uh, um, I had come to doubt whether um, I was capable of uh, um, uh, any other, other sort of job. So when I was finishing my PhD, I had to wonder whether the five years of hard work for pauper's wages were worth it. Was I employable? You'll get a job, my mentor and advisor, Max, assured me. What if I don't? I pressed anxiously. Um, your response, Max, was to offer me an insurance policy. You said, if you don't get a job, I will pay you from my own pocket the market's prevailing wage for an assistant professor next year. And I asked, okay, what's that gonna cost me? And you said $5,000. Um, at that point, I had to do a little bit of soul searching about whether I thought it was worth it. And uh, that decision was informed by an expected value calculation where I had to think about the comparison between the $5,000 insurance premium I would have had to have paid you to guarantee next year's wage um, and the probability that I thought uh, I would be unemployed. 
turns out, at the prevailing wage um, for your insurance policy to be to have been a good deal in expected value terms, monetary only. Um, the probability of me getting a job would have had to have been less than ninety four point four percent. So, having thought through it a long time, talked about it, talking about it with uh, um, my wife Sarah, I eventually decided. Um, to decline your, ins your insurance policy. Um, and when I did, you responded, as I recall, with a great deal of satisfaction. See, you also think you're going to get a job. Um, that was my attempt at calibrating your confidence, if I recall correctly. <laughs> Thank you. And I, and I think I was charging you too much, too. I, I, <laughs> I think that, that premium was, way, was set way too high. So I, I was profit maximizing. Um, um, in the book, I, I accuse you of falling victim to the hindsight bias. Uh, um, that looking back at the fact that uh, and seeing that, that I have managed to remain employed um, uh, might uh, lead you now in retrospect to have overestimated the likelihood of that outcome. Could be. Um, so we've had people listening for quite a while now as, as we've chatted about a variety of, uh, of issues. Um, perhaps you want to get them more involved. So um, I, I understand that you have some work available for everybody in the audience. Indeed, if you're game and you want to go to this URL, tinyurl.com slash perfectly confident, which um, should be appearing in your chat window as a clickable link, that'll take you to a survey, a Qualtrics survey that will ask you to report your confidence in an uncertain quantity. That uncertain quantity is my weight. So this is uh, your guess about what my bathroom scale said this morning. And what you have in front of you is a histogram that breaks the range of possible weights into a set of mutually exclusive and exhaustive bins. And I'm inviting you to report how confident you are that my weight falls in each of these bins. This, is, this parallels an exercise that I have done with forecasting, with um, uh, sales, product sales forecasts for companies that wanna get better about thinking about the uncertainties inherent in the future. Most companies, do their forecasting in a way that exacerbates the natural tendency toward overconfidence. They ask the product managers, most responsible, most familiar with the product, what are sales going to be next quarter, next year, whatever. Uh, and then they base their production quantities on that. Well, the problem with that is that it's not going to be that number. That number at best is drawn from a probability distribution and having some sense of the probability distribution is enormously informative for helping the company balance the risks of overproduction versus underproduction and thinking about um, how likely it is that the sales will be greater than or less than the product manager's best, best guess forecast. So this exercise reduces the natural tendency toward being too sure of a specific outcome and helps people think about the range of possible outcomes. So some people will have completed the exercise at this point and we can look at what they say. So let's go to I'm sharing the right screen here. Let's try that again. Here we go. You can see here the means reported. The most popular bin is 141 to 160 pounds with a range around there. The right answer. Bathroom scale said I weighed 139 this morning. So if we're to look at the numbers, on average, we would see that people are overconfident. 
too sure that they have estimated the right answer. And that is the variety of overconfidence I call over precision. If you're game for it, that if after you've completed that question, the survey takes you on to do other questions, but we don't have time to talk about all of those yet because I think some questions have come in from the audience. Um, I, I'm looking at some questions already, Don, so I'll get us started here. Um, so it was interesting. Um, Dean Harrison mentioned you being very well um, uh, calibrated, um, but we have a question from Dean Harrison's predecessor, Rich Lyons, who was your dean for many years. And he actually asked the question, have you achieved perfect confidence? <laughs> uh, once I thought I did, but um, I was being overconfident. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Um, and uh, we, have a, we have a question here from Annie Duke, who's the, uh, a world champion in poker and the auth author of Thinking in Bets. Um, and she writes, Overconfidence is a ubiquitous concept, so much so that it seems to be mentioned in practically every business piece I read. Can you explain why underconfidence should get equal attention? Related, under what circumstances would we expect to see underconfidence? Yeah, that's such a good question because uh, so many of my colleagues in the field of decision making have written about the risk of overconfidence. Um, underconfidence gets less attention in the decision-making literature. It gets a lot more attention in the self-help literature. And the truth is that my research examines the circumstances under which you get each of them. You're more likely to get people thinking that they're better than others on easy tasks. When I ask my students how good they are at driving compared to their classmates or how honest they are relative to their classmates, they the majority of people think that they're way above average and the mean percentile ranking for the class is above 70, uh, often the, in around the 80th percentile. So these are easy tasks at which most people feel confident. Most of us are honest about most things most of the time. Underplacement, thinking the exaggerated belief that you're worse than others is more likely to happen on difficult tasks. My students tell me they know more Latin, pardon me, less Latin than their classmates, or they're worse jugglers than their classmates. Um, whenever there's some task at which we're experiencing difficulties and others' difficulties are less obvious to us, we'll be prone to underplacing, thinking uh, that we're worse than others when we're not. This is the imposter syndrome, which Dean Harrison opened talking about. When uh, new professors start their jobs, it is common for them to wonder whether they're up for it, to feel like maybe the school made a mistake in hiring them. This is a hard job. There are lots of ways to do it badly and few ways to do it well. And so feeling like you might not be capable is a common sentiment. In both cases, you will improve the calibration of your self-assessment if you gather information about others. So are there senior faculty who experience the same sort of self-doubts that you're experiencing early in their careers? People who persisted, what can they tell you about those self-doubts? Can you get information about others and how uh, they're actually performing, how honest they are, how good of jugglers they are? That can help you calibrate your confidence. Part of the reason why overconfidence gets more play among researchers, I think, is that it's easier to identify. But overconfidence leads us to errors of commission where we act in ways that we later regret. Underconfidence leads to errors of omission where we stay out of competitions where we could have succeeded or decline opportunities that would have turned out well. So I have a related question from Deepak Malhotra, my colleague at the Harvard Business School. He, and my he classmate writes, Kellogg. Yes. Um, uh, he writes, you talk about underconfidence as well. I see it a lot. People who are uh, second guess or self handicap, people who are easily influenced, and students who start their answers with too many apologies and caveats. What are some tips for those people other than don't do that? Are there any <laughs> mental techniques or other strategies that can have a lasting effect? Anything that you could think of that has helped these folks have more confidence? Yeah, so um, gathering information about your rivals or peers can be enormously helpful. 
humanizing the audience. So if you're apprehensive about what you might say to a um, group of, uh, of, of uh, um, wise and attentive audience members who may be reading your book or um, listening to your presentation, um, think about their perspective, their limitations, their interests, their concerns. That, that can sometimes help. Um, the admonition uh, that comes from what is the most popular and most generally useful debiasing technique from psychology. Uh, they consider the opposite strategy that involves asking yourself why you might be wrong can actually be helpful here in getting two types of um, confidence biases um, to uh, help to, to um, cancel each other out in a way. So, um, underplacement is the imposter syndrome, where you think you're worse than others when you're not. Overprecision leads us to be too sure that we have correctly estimated how we place relative to others, or our rank relative to others, or our relative skill or abilities. Don't be so sure. Be willing to question the negative assessment that you've made of your own abilities. What are some of the more positive ways you could think about your condition and reframe what you in the moment feel to be inadequacies. Be willing to question your own fears and skepticisms and listen to the counsel of others with a useful outside perspective who might be able to provide a more objective assessment of your performance and your capabilities. Um, wise, courageous leaders will select advisors who are willing to tell them the truth whether that is, you can handle this, or mm, you might be making a mistake here. You could embarrass yourself. That was terrific, Don, thanks. Um, so Katie Milkman, professor at, uh, at Wharton um, and uh, the host of Curiosology, um, writes, uh, during the current crisis, how can experts best communicate with us about the uncertainties we face in a way that won't destroy our confidence in them? Yeah, that is such an important question because the expression of confidence is tied so intimately to the exercise of leadership. And leaders worry that um, by expressing less than complete confidence, they might undermine others' faith in their capabilities or their merits as a leader. Um, I think that, that this is a, a real and legitimate concern and see a um, wonderful ray of hope in the research of Joe Simmons and Celia Garte. They find that there is a way to thread that needle, to communicate honestly without undermining your credibility as a leader. And the way that comes is in distinguishing your claim of certainty from your acknowledgement of the uncertainty in the world. Here, I think of Craig Fox's distinction between epistemic and aleatory uncertainty. Even the wisest, best informed, most capable farsighted leader cannot anticipate the outcome of a coin flip. The future is unpredictable in lots of ways and to pretend like you know the outcome of uncertain events like coin flips or elections or athletic contests is preposterous. So a well-calibrated, honest leader, their research suggests, can admit the aleatory uncertainty inherent in the world. There's a 60% chance we're gonna win this game, while at the same time asserting confidence in the accuracy of that knowledge, which is to say, I've gathered all the information available to me. I've thought hard about how best to identify the uncertainties that are out there. And here's my best guess of the probabilities that we face. Having informed my decision by those probabilities, the expected values say we should go for it or no. Thank you. Um, very different question from your colleague at Haas, uh, Barry Schwartz who for many years was a psychology professor at Swarthmore and the author of The Paradox of Choice. And he writes, how should one calibrate expectations 
when events are unique. Categorization is problematic, relevance is hard to determine, and probability calculations are more fantasy than reality. What in short should one do in the world of unknown unknowns, which is arguably what most of the uh, most of what the uh, people in the world actually face. Yeah, yeah. The, the next question is a good one and poses a real challenge for the advice that I've offered. Um, it's easy to identify probabilities when you can run a whole bunch of simulations. You can flip a whole bunch of coins and then say with confidence on the next one, the likelihood of heads and tails is probably about 50-50. But when you're dealing with a unique event, the first COVID-19 global pandemic, when will we have a vaccine? That is a massively important question for which we don't have exact historical parallels. The answer to that one has got to involve thinking about parallel situations. So many insightful analyses have come from looking back uh, to the 1918 pandemic and trying to adjust its lessons for our modern situation. And of course, there are hypothetical parallel situations. So there are lots of models out there that um, take as inputs key decisions about governmental policy, lockdowns, and um, shelter in place orders, and then tries to forecast their likely outcomes in the future. Those sorts of inputs are very useful for helping calibrate our confidence. There will be unknown unknowns. So my guess is that lots of companies' forecasts of their second quarter 2020 sales were way off. Their forecasts did not include a high probability of a global pandemic and an economic cataclysm of the sort that, that we've experienced. So it, it's no guarantee uh, for uh, perfect forecasting, but thinking uh, in, a, in a rich and sophisticated way about the range of possible outcomes with a histogram uh, probability distribution, like I invited everyone to complete on guessing my weight, there's some chance that I weigh below 100 pounds. It's not very likely, but if um, the, my body has been severed below the chest here, um, it, I would weigh substantially less than you'd think I did um, if I were intact. So um, uh, surprises happen, um, and their uh, good Bayesian would never put a zero probability on even extreme outcomes. Uh, and thinking about those possible scenarios can help a company uh, uh, um, plan for um, this, these, those sorts of improbable scenarios, if they have cataclysmic consequences, it may nevertheless be worth investing something in insuring against their arrival. So um, it looks like we're going back to COVID here. Um, so Angela Duckworth, um, psychology professor at Penn and author of the best-selling book, Grit, writes, I'm appalled at the inconsistent and generally low compliance with physical distancing and face mask recommendations. Um, I'll add here that my spouse who's watching this is appalled by particularly runners who are huffing and puffing and breathing out at us as they run by without a mask. What Angela writes is, should we blame overconfidence or is something else going on? Um, yeah, uh, so um, my guess is that, that overconfidence has, has a role to play there um, with, with that behavior in particular. Um, there are complex intertemporal trade-offs and self-other trade-offs. Um, the runner's decision not to wear a mask um, is a decision for them to enjoy uh, greater comfort. So wearing a mask while you're running uh, it is a sweaty endeavor um, uh, at the cost of those who are around them. So uh, it may well be a selfish choice. Um, might the runners have made a different decision um, had they taken 
the interests of the larger community more seriously to heart. Um, when you bring forward those ethical concerns, you can um, heighten people's willingness to trade their own self-interest off against the interests of others in a way that is more compatible with the values that, that they would uh, profess and um, with the um, norms of behavior that they themselves would um, say that they should abide by. Um, but uh, often the downplaying of risk, it won't happen to me, I don't know anyone who's sick, uh, makes it easy to underestimate the probability of falling ill. Um, even with COVID-19, even though the probability is small, um, uh, the cost of death suggests that we should take this very seriously. Even uh, the most of us have heard testimonials from those who've contracted the illness, uh, who haven't succumbed to it, but nevertheless um, suffer enormously for a very long period of time. So uh, it's, it's worth protecting ourselves even from a selfish perspective. Another of your Haas colleagues writes in, uh, Jenny Chapman, who wants to know, how do you get an overconfident and resistant decision maker, think leader, mm -hmm. to recognize their overconfidence? So what do you do about sort of the prototypic, maybe slightly obnoxious, overconfident leader? What do you do? Um, it's a good question. Uh, a, a, there's, there's no uh, magical cure for overconfidence. Um, but I think sometimes of the story that Catherine Schultz uh, wrote about in her wonderful book, Being Wrong, Adventures in the Margin of Error, um, when she would tell people what she was writing her book about and they would say to her, oh, you should write about me, I'm wrong all the time. She would say, that's interesting. What are you wrong about right now? <laughs> they didn't have an answer. They, they couldn't have an answer. Um, the beliefs we retain, we retain because we believe them to be true. And so um, at any given point, uh, although it's possible to acknowledge that sometimes you're wrong, uh, it, it's nevertheless tempting to think, well, the stuff I believe now, uh, I believe it because it's true. And so you can get used to being right about everything all the time. Um, Sensible people have to acknowledge that there is the risk that they are wrong about some of the things that they believe. And reflecting on that possibility can be uh, profoundly enlightening. So um, confronting someone by saying, you're overconfident about that, um, as uh, my family routinely does with me, um, uh, it doesn't always produce the, um, uh, a, um, response of uh, acceptance and humility. Um, I have to suppress my own defensive response when they accuse me of that, as Andy accused me not too long ago. I said, Dad, I know when you're overconfident. I said, when? He said, um, when you make a salad you think I'm gonna like, or when you tell your students something that you think they understand. Um, so uh, instead, inviting someone who you think might be overconfident to reflect on circumstances in which they were too sure of themselves. Have you ever been overconfident about anything in the past? Oh yeah, pretty much all of us can think of circumstances when they've been overconfident about things in the past. Um, and then a gentle suggestion that um, it's possible you might be overconfident about some of the things you believe now can help. It doesn't always solve the problem. Moving in a quite different direction, Eric Adams wants to know whether modern day sexism might lead to underconfidence for women. Mm, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, the data on gender differences in, in confidence are, are complicated. Um, uh, I um, had been saying up until recently that I had trouble replicating gender differences in confidence in my lab until I replicated Exley and Kessler's uh, recent result, uh, suggesting women, uh, so they, in a gendered task, I think part of their result has to do with sort of a, a task uh, 
to which gender stereotypes apply. And some people therefore think that men are better at it, even though they weren't, they had some math task. Um, that specifically on gendered tasks, it's easy for um, gender differences uh, in beliefs about performance to arise. Um, so the place where gender differences and overconfidence have shown up in the in published claims that I know of is in uh, overplacement or underplacement, where men seem more prone to thinking that they're better than others, again, specifically on male gendered tasks. Uh, there is very little evidence of male over precision, that is, men being too more sure than women that they're right. If you elicit, say, 90% confidence intervals or subjective probability distributions, as in the weight guessing task, you don't find gender differences there. Um, is it possible that the differences that we see, the gender differences we see, are the result of um, uh, socialization or, or cultural messages that, that um, boys and girls get or men and women get? I think that that is entirely plausible, especially because those differences are strongest, seem to be strongest on tasks where gender stereotypes are most relevant, even when there is no consistent actual gender difference on those tasks. So I think that does hint at, at a cultural origin to gender differences in overconfidence um, and uh, makes me hopeful of the possibility of um, reducing those uh, errors, those biases going forward. So David Daniels um, brings up the topic of how do we best change behavior or, or address overconfidence? Do we debias human intuition or should we rely on choice architecture or what many people refer to as nudging? What's the best way to go to fix this problem? Oh. Yeah, I, I, I think I, I wouldn't want to um, uh, just stick to one solution. Uh, I think most forms of overconfidence are multiply determined and uh, um, uh, attacking them uh, from multiple angles is, is therefore useful. Um, there are certainly structural debiasing tools that, that we can implement, and I'm a fan of those. Um, um, helping people be a little bit more self-aware can also be helpful. Um, those uh, um, tools to increase self-awareness can be as simple as um, inviting people to reflect on the probability that they might be biased. In my um, MBA classes, I have students rate themselves on a percentile scale. Um, when they do that, half of them get a question at the beginning of the, of, of the survey that notes um, the, all, all of our, that all of us are vulnerable to self-serving biases, that it's easier for us to believe flattering things than things that, that put us in, in a less flattering light. Um, and I invite them to put themselves on a percentile scale with respect to their vulnerability to self-serving bias. When that question comes first, the overplacement on all the questions that follow is reduced a little bit relative to responses from students who get that question last. So being a little bit more self-aware can help. Again, let me highlight my message on good calibration. I don't think it's a great strategy to tell everybody to be less confident. I think better is if we can help ourselves calibrate our judgments. So um, I'm pleased that the underconfidence my students report on juggling and Latin knowledge doesn't go down in the condition where they get the note on self-serving bias at the beginning. What we'd like is tools that help people reflect in a way that increases their accuracy and not to just become more pessimistic across the board. Thanks. Don, uh, sort of I brought up this theme of is overconfidence ever good? And that theme just keeps on coming up in a variety of questions. So I'm going to read one from Sheen Levine, um, who uh, talks about your own work. He says, if I recall cor your work correctly, um, you showed that overconfidence can sometimes pay, causing an overconfident person to be better assessed by others. Is it possible that overconfidence is beneficial in social situations as when dissuading potential rivals from challenging you? Yes. Um, there, so uh, pretending to be better than you are can help you gain credibility 
with others, can help you gain status in groups as my research with Cameron Anderson and Sebastian Brown and Jessica Kennedy shows. Um, it is also um, problematic uh, as other of my research shows, other research with, with Cameron and Jessica, um, uh, being exposed as overconfident gets you knocked back down to size. Um, it can be evolutionarily stable to pretend like you're better than you are as this interesting model by Dominic Johnson published in, in Nature a few years back suggests. Uh, nevertheless, to engage in such a strategy intentionally raises the specter of deception and hypocrisy by the would-be leader who practices it. So it, is, it ranks up there with a number of strategies, including lying, cheating, stealing, which can be beneficial in the short term, but which have long-term costs and are probably inconsistent with the values that most of us would like to aspire to in our own behavior and our own leadership. So my HBS colleague, um, Allison Brooks, asks a related question. She says, have you or others thought about how calibration might help or hurt people in their conversations and or relationships over time? Which wow. seems connected to what you just talked about as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, here I think of research by uh, Samin Vizier and Liz Tenney suggesting that there are relationship benefits to good calibration. Their, their research suggests that um, those who have the best calibrated, most accurate sense of their own abilities and limitations um, have the most harmonious relationships with intimate others and friends, that there are um, interpersonal benefits to um, understanding yourself, uh, being able to appreciate your strengths and your weaknesses um, with clear eyed honesty and to being well calibrated in your self assessments. So um, yes, uh, I, I think the answer to Alison's question is affirmative. Okay, so we've been primarily talking about psychology with a dash of analytics and economics, but we got a sociological question Excellent. from, from you, again, this one from another of your colleagues, Samir Srivastava, who writes, your prescriptions seem to be focused on the individual leader. Can you say more about what organizational practices or structures can help the organization as a whole become better calibrated? Yeah, uh, there are, um, uh, daunting organizational challenges uh, associated with my invitation to be better calibrated because so many organizations set up systems that reward overconfidence. Everything from bidding systems that are more likely to select overconfident bidders to promotion systems that reward uh, overconfident people at work. Um, sometimes there are organizational fixes that companies can implement that helps, uh, helps debias uh, some people. Um, so uh, the uh, one um, sort of uh, notorious example is in an attempt to uh, counteract project planners optimistic forecast of project completions and budgets uh, there um, are stories of some companies uh, taking, say, for instance, software engineers forecast of how long it's going to take to complete a project and doubling it or tripling it uh, to get a more accurate assessment. Uh, I think that um, uh, th those sorts of fixes, those sorts of institutional fixes can be interesting, uh, but raise other problems like inconsistency, interpersonal and inter, uh, intertemporal inconsistency, where, for instance, if the project planner knows that his or her boss is gonna take their estimate of time to completion and double it before they take that to the customer, then the project planner is gonna say, well, 
um, you're going to exaggerate how long it's going to take. I'll cut my estimate in half. And so um, better than those sorts of um, uh, institutional or routine fixes would be, be would be better to de-bias the judgments of the individuals involved. Uh, I will acknowledge that in many circumstances that may be a tall order, but the fact that individuals are embedded in organizational systems that can sometimes reward overconfidence uh, adds uh, a, a complexity and a, and a wrinkle to the um, advice that uh, can seem simpler when I delivered at the individual level. So uh, guilty as charged, Samir. So KDS wants to know, are powerful people more overconfident than those with less power? If so, how can those who report to them recalibrate them without getting fired? <laughs> uh, that's a great question. Um, I think that um, we ought to be concerned about people in leadership positions being more overconfident, both because of selection and as a treatment of consequence of, of treatment that they get in their elevation to the position of leadership. So the selection effect is if we are promoting to positions of status and leadership, those who are expressing the most confidence about themselves and the, their potential for the future, their own performance, as um, we can see happens in politics with distressing frequency, uh, then we will be selecting for those who are most overconfident. It is also the case that as you um, move up the status hierarchy, as you are elevated to positions of authority, you're surrounded by more people who depend on you, have more motivation to flatter you and to curry favor. And so they will be blowing sweet smelling smoke your direction. And if your ego tempts you to believe it, you could well be fooled into uh, being overconfident. What's the remedy? Um, a, uh, an effective remedy is most likely to come from a courageous leader willing to surround themselves with people who have the courage to criticize and disagree with them. Courageous leaders will indeed invite that disagreement. You want people who are willing to tell you you're making a mistake and for you to be able to hear that criticism. Uh, it is um, easy for um, uh, weak leaders or e leaders whose egos are easily threatened to prefer to surround themselves with people who um, affirm them, support them, celebrate them, and praise them. Uh, that is likely to, in to magnify the risk that they make uh, an error of commission, that they make some high stakes decision that later turns out to be a mistake. Uh, leaders should want honest, critical feedback to help reduce their own vulnerability to overconfidence. So a question from Dolly Chug, um, NYU professor and, um, and presenter of a very famous TED talk related to her book on becoming the person you wanna be, um, writes, what is something you wish you had included in the book but didn't or couldn't for whatever reason? I wish that I had said more about the value of taking Annie Duke, Annie Duke's advice on um, thinking in bets as a debiasing strategy for overconfidence. So in her book, she talks brilliantly about the benefit of asking ourselves and one another, want to bet? When there's some important wager you're willing to make about the future in the form of a decision, a commitment to a job, a, an, an investment, a friend, a potential life's partner, um, thinking about the risks associated with that and asking want to bet can be useful in adjust, adjusting your confidence appropriately. So um, Annie Duke writes about how poker players challenge each other uh, when someone makes a, an assertion that one of their poker buddies uh, doubts, they will often say, want to bet. So uh, when someone says, yeah, I could be happy living in Des Moines, or I could lose 100 pounds if I wanted to, their poker buddies will say, want to bet? Disciplining your beliefs, your forecasts of the future with a 
bet that has stakes. Maybe it ju it's just reputational stakes. Uh, but thinking about your uncertainty as a bet is very useful, especially when you can get a smart, well-informed person who's willing to take the other side. Ask what they know that you don't. And that conversation can be enormously helpful for helping you calibrate your confidence. So I'm going to ask you one more question, and then we'll probably need to move toward a close. And this comes from Samin Vazir, who wants to know how responsive are people to feedback? Does getting accurate feedback increase people's calibration or move them toward being perfectly confident? Um, feedback is often an imperfect corrective. The um, history, the, the published history of debiasing attempts with overprecision in judgment in particular is a depressing one. There is a long string of debiasing attempts that have a small effect that is short lived and doesn't seem to generalize very well beyond the one context in which it is applied. Um, so, um, the, the more general debiasing strategy is one that I've, I've talked about already. Um, and that involves an adjustment in the way that we think about our own certainty, asking yourself why you might be wrong and asking yourself, want to bet? It is a habit of mind that is useful for generating self-doubt in constructive ways and inviting you to consider other perspectives. This would include in cons considering the perspectives of those who might disagree with you. So it may be particularly uncomfortable when it comes to political partisans who uh, you may regard as misguided or perhaps uh, even stupid for believing what they believe. Well. The truth is that even on the most divisive issues, perhaps especially on the most divisive issues, there are people of goodwill can disagree with one another. And thinking about what they know, what they believe that brings them to their beliefs can be insightful for understanding them and for gaining greater insight into your own views. So um, debiasing techniques, asking yourself why you might be wrong and exposing yourself to critics um, is helpful. So to move us toward close, uh, first of all, Don, you have about a dozen questions that we haven't touched on. So um, are you going to answer these folks offline? I will, and, yeah. So, and, uh, and, and what can other people do to follow up? How do they buy your book? How do they buy dozens of copies for Christmas <laughs> presents in advance? Buy for um, everyone you know. Yeah. Um, so uh, my book's website, perfectlyconfident.com. Uh, th there's a, a link there. Um, uh, in the header uh, for where to buy it. Um, and uh, if you're considering buying it, buying it uh, in its first week runs, uh, offers me the best chance that the book might wind up on a bestseller list. Um, and if you are so moved and want to post a review of it, I would be profoundly grateful um, at Amazon or Goodreads. Um, that, that helps other people find the book. Um, let's see, were those the, the shamelessly self-serving plugs I wanted to get in? And what um, about answering people's questions who I didn't get around to asking? Yes, I will um, take the, the questions that came in um, that I wasn't able to answer, um, and those maybe that um, I think I could have answered better, and uh, post those answers in text uh, on the, the book's website. Um, and it, it, with your indulgence, Max, I, I think I should end by acknowledging the many people that made this project possible. So um, the, uh, I am indebted to many. Uh, I, I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge those people. So uh, first, the, the many wonderful colleagues whose 
inspiration and collaboration allowed me to do the research that has informed the book. And that's a long list and incomplete uh, subset of them includes George Lowenstein, Liz Tenney, Jen Logg, Daylene Kane, Francesca Gino, and Nate Meikle, and Cameron Anderson, Jessica Kennedy, Phil Tetlock, Barb Mellers, Deb Small, Sam Swift, PJ Healy, and many, many others. Um, thanks to Margot Fleming, my agent who encouraged me to pick the project up when I lacked confidence in its success, and to Hollis Heimbach at, at HarperCollins, my editor, who was confident enough in the potential of the project to bet on it. Um, a special note of thanks to my wife, Sarah, and my boys, Josh and Andy, for helping me calibrate my confidence. Um, a special thanks to you, Max, for raking me over the coals today um, and for getting me started in, in my career. Thanks to everybody who joined in today um, and uh, for those who will courageously sacrifice their many hours um, reading or listening uh, to the book. Um, again, if you're willing to share your opinion, please post a review. Um, that's it that I've got. Any closing words? Thank you, Don. This was terrific. It was a pleasure talking to you as always. Uh, Dean Harrison, thanks for uh, joining us. And um, thanks to all the folks who uh, spent an hour of your evening with us. Thank this you very fun. much. Thanks.